from Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Hey, everybody. I'm not going to show you the video. You can find it anywhere you like. It's all over the internet. You can get the original film. You can get into the conspiracy. But I want you to learn it the way the people of the times learned it. You know, as always, on that November 22nd, 1963, you talk to anybody who was alive at that time, and they all know where they were when they heard it. And they probably heard it the way you just heard it, with Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, one of the most famous, if not the most famous new newscaster ever. Kennedy assassination was an obvious tragedy. And again, I don't want to get into all of the crazy conspiracy theories. I shouldn't say crazy, because I'm not 100% sure that there weren't two gunmen, that the CIA, the FBI, the Mafia, the Communists, Khrushchev, you name your theories. I'm not 100% sure that it was just Oswald. So I shouldn't call it crazy conspiracy theories. But I don't want to spend time with that. That's, you know, go look on that. There's, there's more than you, can, than you could ever want on the internet about that. Be careful, use your historical skills. Let's learn why there are so many conspiracy theories. Again, not saying that they're not true, any of them, but realize why this was such a tragedy. What is it about this Kennedy legacy? You know, I dressed for the occasion, at least a little bit. You know, he's a, he's a Harvard boy. He's a, yet another Yankee. You know, John Adams, John Quincy Adams. Uh, we know the importance of Massachusetts in the Revolution. And you'll see why this matters later on, especially, you know, during the Civil Rights Movement, who could be the worst possible person to get Southerners to desegregate during the 60s? Oh, I don't know, some Yankee snobby know-it-all kind of guy? You know what I'm talking about. So yeah, he's a Yankee, no doubt about that. Everybody knew it. But what do I mean by the Kennedy legacy? Well, First Irish Catholic president of the United States. And you know, when he was running for president, he of course was asked how he could make his first duty to uphold the Constitution when he was supposed to listen to the Pope. Yeah, I deal with a lot, but finally, finally, my fellow potato people, finally the Irish have made it. An Irish Quincy boy from Boston is now president of the United States. Wow. He, of course, is the man who uh, got us to the moon. He wasn't there, of course, when we finally got there, but we all know that this nation should commit itself to going to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. His idea. Now, in this picture, of course, that's not... John F. Kennedy. That's his brother Bobby. Bobby was even more a proponent of civil rights, working with Dr. King, as you can see here. Even more so than his brother, who was a little bit more cautious, perhaps because he was president. But certainly John F. Kennedy took those crucial steps, which you remember from our last video, to help with the march on Washington. Of course, it's not a, a, perfect, a perfect story. Some were very critical that Kennedy did not get involved sooner. Some people turn around and say, well, yeah, that's because, you know, he was a Harvard man and the Southerners weren't going to listen to some Northerner telling the Southerners what to do and others that, you know, he did not get involved enough. So there's all kinds of analysis about whether John F. Kennedy really was a civil rights leader. Certainly he did more than Eisenhower did, but maybe that's because it's what the circumstances dictated. 
It's always hard to talk about a man who's been murdered. And that's why it's very hard to evaluate the short three years of the Kennedy presidency. Think about that. Three years as president, yet many of you know him a heck of a lot better than some of our eight-year presidents. And then, of course, is all of his famous phrases. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I'm sure you've all heard about that. You've probably heard the torch has been passed to a new generation. Kennedy is uh, well known for a lot of his famous quotes, but there is one very, very, very important part of the whole ask not idea. I really want you young people especially to realize, and that was that something in Kennedy spoke to this new generation. A desire to continue leading, to, for America to continue its its global position, spreading freedom of democracy. And that's why Kennedy started something called the Peace Corps. The slogan, the toughest job you'll ever love. Now, of course, the Peace Corps was not something that completely and totally changed the world, unless you want, of course, want to argue that it's changing it one person at a time. The Peace Corps certainly, however, gave, uh, gave a home to to young people, people like you who wanted to help not only their country but especially the world. And, uh, what you did is uh, you went off. I shouldn't say what you did, what you do. You can still join the Peace Corps right now. Still uh, go out there and go to some third world nation perhaps and uh, help them build a school. My own college roommate ended up doing that, in fact, uh, to a small country that I'd never heard of before, Lesotho in southern Africa. Go in and help them build plumbing, roads, and make them feel good about America. Now, yes, of course, this was the height of the Cold War, and it was a way of, of proving to the world that democracy and capitalism and freedom was a better way of life. Yes, you cynics, you can say that's the reason for the Peace Corps, but it didn't matter to those people who joined it. They joined it because they believed in freedom, they believed in America, they, they wanted to help. So Kennedy, Kennedy really did speak to a new generation, and yes, even though he was a veteran of World War II, he wasn't Eisenhower. Eisenhower was an older generation. Roosevelt, of course, even before that, and Truman. Kennedy was, well, he himself said it as inaugural, forged in World War II. And then, of course, there's Camelot. How many of you know the story of King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table? John F. Kennedy's administration was many times referred to as Camelot. Uh, this new idea of everything being wonderful and uh, a new young family in the White House. And, and this was a big part of it. A family in the White House again. Little kids in the White House. They haven't had little children in the White House since Teddy Roosevelt. More than 50 years, half a century since the White House saw children running around in it. They were a family. Remember that. I uh, actually don't remember that, but you may remember when I talked about his wife Jackie begging to let him die, let them die together during the Cuban Missile Crisis in our last video that we talked about. Jackie Kennedy, as you can see, a quite young and attractive woman. John was actually many times intimidated by her. I remember the story of when the, the two of them went off to, uh, to France and uh, everybody kept focusing on, on Jackie and, and the President of the United States felt like a third wheel. But one of the things that Jackie did, for example, which may help to make her really popular, she did a television special. This is a picture of it right here. Uh, from the White House and stuff, she gave people a tour of the White House. This is what your president's house looks like. This is what your house looks like. And talked an awful lot about it. It was quite a hit, especially uh, with the television audience. So they were this wonderful family, this young family, this promising family, this family with hopes and dreams. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Kennedy, whether you loved him or hated him, inspired an awful lot of people, especially people his own age, 
43 years old, if our memory serves me, one of the youngest, if not the youngest president at that time ever. And then, of course, he gets assassinated. You see, this is the picture I wanted to show you. I don't want to show you anything else about the Kennedy assassination. I want to show you her face. Look at Jackie Kennedy's face. Remind yourself that she is the mother of two little children. That her husband has just been murdered next to her, in the car next to her. His head shot off, Jackie unbelievably reaching up, climbing up on top of a speeding convertible, grabbing the piece of his head that's been shut off, going to the hospital with him and asking the doctors if they could repair, put him back together. She lived through all of that. Her husband died in front of her, and there she is right now. Look at her face. What's she gonna, what's this widow going to do now? This is the, the pain of the Kennedy assassination. And this is why I have so much trouble with all the sensationalized conspiracy theories. It doesn't change, of course, the importance of understanding why he got murdered, who murdered him, and perhaps any cover-ups involved. Yes, but remember the pain. She's in shock, especially I shouldn't say special. In addition, because the man taking over, the vice president, now president, Lyndon B. Johnson, who we'll talk about more in just a few minutes, well, she and her, he and her husband uh, did not get along, and that is maybe one of the biggest political understatements you could ever. It's, a, it's almost shocking to realize that Kennedy and Johnson were the same political party, Democrats, of course. So, this brings us now to the idea of the Kennedy curse. We'll review this in more detail in a few minutes, but you may remember during, our, again, our Cuban Missile Crisis discussion, that Bobby Kennedy, the younger brother of John, was in his cabinet, a very, very, very rare occurrence to have your brother, any family member, sitting on the president's cabinet with you. Bobby the Attorney General, whose book 13 Days, of course, is considered one of the, the greatest summations, primary sources of what actually happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Bobby, some considered to be even more popular than John, the, the, a shoo-in for president in 1968. Think about this. Lyndon Johnson was not that popular for lots of reasons we'll talk about in a little while. Bobby, the brother of the murdered John, the tragic story of the Kennedy family. Bobby, incredibly popular, a man who, uh, not only worked with Dr. King, but was well known for going after organized crime, going after the mafia. He had a lot of appeal. And as he ran for president in 1968, yes, you heard me right, he's running for president. Wait, I thought he would be running for president. Yeah, now the Kennedys are coming to take their position back. So he's running for president, Democratic Primaries are going on. The California primary, he's in California. Pretty much, I don't want to say it was a given that he was going to win, but certainly he had an incredible chance of taking over for his brother and becoming the next president of the United States. And then he gets assassinated by a man named Sirhan Sirhan. Now, these are the basic details of it. However, it's just an incredible story. Kennedy gives this speech. He's in in Los Angeles, it's 1968. After the speech, he leaves through the kitchen. And as he's leaving, there's kitchen people all around. He's shaking hands, how you doing? And he gets assassinated. And this is controversial too. Believe it or not, Sir Han, Sir Han is still alive. And uh, some say he either didn't do it or he wasn't alone. That one's controversial too. But I'm not gonna talk about that. 
Look it up again if you want. His name is Sirhan Sirhan. So he's now been murdered, assassinated. Some, of course, thought that it was some kind of a, a Middle East kind of thing because Sirhan Sirhan was a Palestinian immigrant. And then, then, there's the youngest of the brothers, Teddy Kennedy. Here's John, here's Bobby, and there's Teddy. Teddy, everybody figured by the 1970s, would also run for president of the United States. That he could take over the youngest one, two murdered, third time's the child kind of thing. He was very, very popular again, and especially in New England. <sighs> well, Chappaquiddick is an island. It's off, of, not too far away from Cape Cod. For you Jaws fans, right near Martha's Vineyard where they filmed the movie. And it was a party. And uh, he had a little too much to drink. And he took his date home that night. And they were driving on this dirt road. You notice how thin the bridge is. Well, long story short, Kennedy loses control of the car. The car goes off into the water. Kennedy manages to get out of the car, swim to safety, and leaves the girl behind to die. He makes his way back and doesn't tell the authorities until that morning what's happened. Eventually, he was, uh, he was released. Well, he was never charged with murder, but he was found guilty of leaving the scene of an accident. And most people have said that Chappaquiddick prevented Kennedy from ever running for president. He managed to serve as, <laughs> when he died in 2009, the longest running serving senator at that time. So he served in the Senate through the math for more than three decades, but he could never run for president because of what happened at Chappaquiddick. This curse, Jackie herself thought the family was cursed, is unreal. I, I haven't even said them all. Let me review it for you if you don't mind, okay? There was not just three Kennedy boys. They were an Irish Catholic family. They were a big family. Kennedy, John, was not, was not the oldest. He had an older brother, Joseph. Joseph died in World War II. He had an older sister, Kathleen. Kathleen died in a plane crash near the end of World War II. John himself, of course, was assassinated in 1963 in Dallas, Texas. His brother, Bobby, five years later in 1968 in California. His brother, Teddy, had his political career, or rather his political ambitions running for president, destroyed in Chappaquiddick. And then it goes to the next generation. Michael Kennedy, who's Bob, Michael Kennedy, who's Bobby's son, died in a skiing accident shortly before you were born. And finally, John F. Kennedy's son, John F. Kennedy Jr., this is him right here. Remember that little boy in the White House earlier? There's mom, Jackie, father, John. He and his family were killed in a plane accident in 1999. And even then, it goes with the grandchildren. You can actually fall on the ancient if you want to. I'm not going to. I think I've had enough. So if nothing else, the whole Kennedy story has fascinated Americans for almost 50 years now. Actually, I guess it's more than 50 years, isn't it? So it was a decade of assassination. So let's remind ourselves, okay? We have John in 63. We have, and I haven't had a chance to teach you much about Malcolm X. I apologize for that. But, you know, we can only have as much time as we have. Malcolm X, another civil rights leader, murdered. Then, of course, we have Martin Luther King, assassinated in 1968, and Bobby Kennedy in 1968 as well. Four different leaders. One, a president, another one, aspiring to be president, and two civil rights leaders. All murdered 
in the 1960s. When was the last time you remember any famous assassinations? Uh, McKinley, 1898. Uh, before that, uh, Lincoln. Four. Four within five years of each other. It's not just a decade of them. It happens in a time span of half a decade. In five years. What a crazy decade the 60s were. My gosh. Ask your parents, what was it like? Assassination after assassination. Almost afraid to turn on the news and see a city burning again. Like what happened after Dr. King's assassinations. And at the very same time, something was going on in a faraway land. Yeah, of course, I'm talking about Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam, tomato, tomato. Unfortunately, that's all he's remembered for. Lyndon B. Johnson, notice the hat, a Texan. A Texan. Why is that important? You'll see in just a minute. But look, if what's so amazing about Lyndon B. Johnson is that the greatest thing he ever did by far inside America is one of the greatest things any president's ever done. Now, of course, the Great Society is extremely controversial. Some would call it New Deal Part Two, but it's big time. You are affected no matter what. You are affected by LBJ's Great Society. Nobody remembers it, of course, because everybody thinks about Vietnam and what's about to happen, as you're going to see. But I'd like to talk about the good news first, to realize how much we should know about Lyndon B. Johnson, why he was such an important president, okay? Let's start again. He's a fourth generation Texan, a Democrat, worked with Franklin Roosevelt, a senator for many, many years. Why is it a big deal that he's a Texan? Well, A, how the heck do you think that Harvard man got elected president? By putting together a Harvard man and a Texan. But by the way, they did not get along at all, like I told you earlier. At some point, in fact, LBJ even thought that the Kennedys were up to get him. But, remember what I said Kennedy's problem was in making the civil rights movement go forward? How could some Yankee tell Southerners how to integrate their schools after Brown versus Board? Johnson is not a Yankee. He's a Texan. This is a Southerner telling his fellow Southerners, hey man, it's time to change. That's a lot different. It's a lot different. And that's why he can start this thing called the Great Society. Take a look at all of these things that the Great Society does. I get it. We don't have time to go over all this, but just look at this list from 64 to 67. Economic Opportunity Act, Civil Rights Act, obviously a big deal. Elementary and Secondary Education, Social Security Amendments, Voting Rights Act, Water Quality Act, Clean Air Amendments, Higher Education Act, Motor Vehicle Safety Laws, and air, another Air Quality Act. Johnson is taking the government to another level again in this great society. One of the things that I really love about this idea that Johnson started going with was it was a a way of um, a way of reevaluating government's purpose. And when I say what I love, it's not necessarily I agree or disagree with what Johnson was doing, but that he came up with a new way of trying to figure out the government was doing its job. You know, remember Jefferson, as long as the government gives me life, liberty, and allows me to pursue my happiness, stay out of my way, bro. That's all that they wanted out of the government. FDR comes in along and the government needs to supply some kind of a safety net. Well, what did the, what did the Great Society say? The Great Society said the only way to measure the value of a great society is by looking at how its poorest live. You can't say you're a great nation if you have homeless people on the streets. If people are living in poverty, if the air isn't clean, if the water is polluted. It's not just how free you are, it's how wealthy everybody is. It wasn't a, 
It wasn't seen as a communist, although certainly as many people did label it that way, as a, as a communist kind of idea. But the, this was more of a way of seeing, of, of lifting up the poor. Again, the critics of it will say it's socialism. They'll say things like, uh, well, I'll give you an example. The free lunch program we have at schools. That comes out of the Great Society. Some would say that's communism. Johnson would say the only way to make sure we don't have communism is for our poor to at least have a chance of moving up in society. Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, some of the most, oh, I don't know how else to describe this to you young people, but uh, just try, just try to tell grandma that we should do away with Medicare or Medicaid and see what her reaction is going to be. And you begin to understand the power of this great society. And again, unfortunately, nobody remembers this. If you ask the average American what president of the United States was responsible for Medicare, what president of the United States uh, started things like air quality acts, and what president of the United States signed the Civil Rights Act? Maybe one in a hundred would be able to guess Johnson. But you ask what president of the United States started the war in Vietnam, and they're all going to say Johnson. Johnson. You know what people at that point in time called Johnson? A lot of them, sorry, I'm going to swear ahead for just a second. He was that son of a bitch, Johnson. You'll see why in a little while. People vehemently hated Johnson. Not yet, but they will. Well, why? Okay? Well, first of all, they're wrong. Johnson did not start the war in Vietnam. If you want to give anybody credit, that's him start with Eisenhower. Eisenhower was the first president of the United States. You may remember the NBN Battle of 1954, in which the Vietnamese kicked out the French. Eisenhower chose to start sending American military advisors to the South Vietnamese so that they could prepare for, oh, I don't know, some kind of a war. John F. Kennedy did the same thing. He increased the level of advisors. But everybody thinks of Johnson because of the Gulf of Tonkin. Gulf of Tonkin, it's right outside of North Vietnam, you know, it's uh, Kind of like the Gulf of Mexico. We all know where the Gulf of Mexico is. And the United States military would often park itself inside the Gulf of Tonka, you know, to keep an eye on what was going on in that communist nation up there. And in August of 1964, the USS Maddox was attacked by North Vietnamese gunboats. Unfortunately, we're not 100% sure this is actually true. If I want to be 100% accurate, I would say the USS Maddox reported it was attacked on August 2nd. There are some people who believe that it did not happen, that it was an accident, that there was fog or other kinds of things. Again, I'm not going to get into that. What matters in history, in history, is not so much what actually happened as what people believe happened. Of course it's important to know what actually happened, but it's even more important to look up what people believe to have happened because what they believe is what they end up acting on. And what do they act on? The President of the United States reports to Congress that American ship has been attacked. He asks for Congress for permission to respond militarily, and here is the big, 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 big deal. In asking Congress to respond militarily, notice I did not say ask for a declaration of war. He did not ask for a declaration of war. He simply asked to re respond militarily, and that, in my opinion, is the biggest mistake that Congress ever made. I realize that's saying a lot. The biggest mistake Congress ever made was to approve the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Why? Why was that such a big deal? Because what it basically did was it gave away all of its power to the President of the United States. Now, you would disagree with me if you believe that the United States President should have completely and totally no limits whatsoever. You do not believe in the check and balance system. 
and that the President of the United States should be allowed to conduct foreign policy completely and totally by himself. If you feel that way, well, then you disagree with me. But if you believe in the check and balance system, that there should be both uh, a presidential, a president with certain powers and a Congress with certain powers, and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was just, I mean, was Congress brain dead? This allowed the president to continue to escalate the Vietnam conflict. Notice how I said that. Technically, technically, it's not a war. Now, don't ever tell that to the Vietnam vet. That technically it's not a war, because we never declared war. Technically, it's a conflict. A conflict that Congress could not stop. Since they never declared war, there was no war for them to stop. Until the most recent war in Afghanistan a few years ago, the Vietnam War was the longest-running conflict that the United States had ever been in. 20 years, 21 years, as you can see. Beginning in Eisenhower's administration and going all the way through. Anybody know who was President of the United States in 1975? We'll tell you later. Five presidents involved in one war. Put that in respect of World War II had one president. Roosevelt. Vietnam. Five presidents. Okay? Now, Congress will eventually wake up and realize it's a mistake. It'll pass the War Powers Act in 1973. Too little, too late for the, Vietnam, for the Vietnam vets, of course. But this does limit the powers of the president today, at least somewhat. Um, in that, for example, if President Trump wanted to uh, respond to uh, a military incursion in Iraq or Iran, 